Well, thank you all for joining us. I'll start the introduction again. My name is Aaron Kagan Putt. I'm a professor of art and design. Uh, for this year's virtual liberal arts and sciences symposium, we created an online exhibition of student artwork. And that ranges from drawing, painting, photography, graphic and web design, video and animation. And I'll post a link to that right now so you all can see. So there's a link to the virtual exhibition of student artwork. If you click that link, you'll see A second, I'll let everybody else in. If you click the link in the chat, it will take you to the web page that is the online exhibition of student artwork. Like I said, you'll notice that there's drawing, painting, photography, graphic, and web design, video, and animation represented within that exhibition. We in the art department are super honored to share this work with you all. I think you'll agree that the artwork presented on the site is really fantastic and represents the breadth and quality of work our students are making here at Oglethorpe. Um, we've organized this panel as a way to for visitors to the online exhibition to have an opportunity to speak with the artists that have created this great work. Um, it's going to be fairly open ended. And since I haven't really hosted a a talk like this, um, we're going to do it. Oh, it looks like the link didn't appear. Let me send that link again. Aaron, are you sending it in the chat? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Did that appear now? Yeah. All right. So take a second to look through the website if you haven't had a chance to do so. And like I said, we'll be playing this a bit by ear, but the idea is that if you have some questions for the artists whose work is represented on the website, this will be an opportunity, opportunity for you to talk with those artists. You can talk with the artists as a group or individually, and I can set up uh, breakout rooms for that to happen. And feel free to use either the hand raising function or you can just start talking or you can uh, use the chat to do so as well. I'm using my real hands. All right, I like it. I already have a question. Um, of course, I couldn't, once I started asking students to send work to Aaron and Jack uh, Owen, I actually couldn't stop. There's so much good work. I had a hard time stopping. Poor Jack. Um, people were sending him work yesterday, probably five minutes ago still. Uh, so first, I could not be more impressed at the amount and quality of the work being done. And I'm very impressed and appreciative of what you um, two have done, Aaron and Jack. Thank you uh, so much. And just now, scrolling through the show, I noticed, of course, a lot of the work I am familiar with because um, I asked students to submit it. But um, experimental drawing, having just talked about um, briefly about uh, Kandinsky with Lauren, the Lauren Jones, here I see some Kandinsky-esque non-objectivity going on, and it's not imitating Kandinsky. It seems to me to be going to the heart of what Kandinsky was doing, and it's not imitating in any way. It's very original. And uh, like Dea McCorkle, I'm looking at yours here, and Muscans and Montserrat Olvera, Olivera, Olvera, a lot of names like Kayla. I know a lot, some of the names and not all of them. And I've got to say uh, what a thrill it is uh, to see some of this work. Even students I know pretty darn well are doing work like I've never seen before. So to me, that's my first thrill at to be to see this show. It's offered us an opportunity to, to show a range uh, and an amount of work we've never been able to do before. Um, so do some of you who have participated in the experimental drawing class, which is a new class that's currently going on right now, want to talk about the process, what you've learned in the class, maybe the process of uh, using automatic drawing to uh, generate ideas. 
day. Do you want to start and talk about some of your work that's shown there? Is that in the drawing section? Yes, exactly. It's at the bottom of the drawing section. So if you click the drawing link at the top, that will bring you to a page that is only the drawing. Oh, here I, oh, yeah. Sorry, I saw it's already, <laughs> I already saw it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can actually share some of it. Yeah. Go to that. Talk about a range of work on this one page, y'all. Day is not appearing on mine. Let me refresh this. Yeah, I saw day is the first time, and then it, there it is. I'd like to put someone on the spot. Day and McCorkle, can you tell us how you did? What's up with this drawing? Where it came from? How you did it? Um, I actually started off by like tracing a like cosmetology face template thing on two pieces of Doralar, and I cut them. I cut two pieces of it together and just layered it together, which got like the weird like eye thing going on. And then I had like random stuff, like this is a tissue paper thing from a birthday gift I had. And this is like dot grid paper. I just had random stuff and I layered it together. Well, it's really sophisticated and vi purely visually sophisticated, but it's also sophisticated in terms of the sort of um, the way the images are laid together, the textures and the back and forth that makes us kind of go in and back out again by the way you use that, um, the transparencies. And it's very sophisticated. Thank well you. done. Shadani, do you want to talk a little bit about some of your work? Um, you can talk about the process. Maybe you can talk about this, which looks like more of a traditional drawing, but maybe when you describe how it was made, that will add some, uh, make it clear that this is a fairly experimental process that you used. Yeah, for this one, we used um, not normal um, objects. So for this drawing, I believe I used a flower and some leaves with black paint. And then towards the bottom of the shell, I used um, the stretching method. So I actually um, painted with black paint first and then with, I believe it might've been a fork, I scratched out parts of it. And then the side of the shell, I think I also used a shell to paint this drawing specifically. So part of the process for this assignment and some of the assignments that we've done in the experimental drawing is using, using unusual implements. So for example, um, natural objects, as Shadani mentioned, uh, forks or a flower or sticks. For some of the other drawings, students had to tape a um, paintbrush or a pencil or a piece of charcoal to a long stick and draw that way. Some of the other drawings were created using surrealist methods of automatic drawing, where mark making is fairly improvisational. And then um, you, the idea is that you allow the unconscious mind to take over and to pull out parts and imagery that appears. And then from there, it's experimenting with other materials and non-traditional materials. For example, some of the drawings were painted using food And you can see that there's also some collage that's happening and layering of transparency in some of these. I have a question for you, Aaron. Yes. How, how do they know when to quit? Wouldn't it be easy to go too far and lose one of these? Uh, definitely. Part of the process is we work together and then talk about the work as it's being created. So there's some critique happening in process. And then um, 
and really there is some push towards um, because the class is all about experimentation there's a lot of encouragement towards experimentation and then the idea is to dial it back if if the work goes too far and I guess that is part of the learning process is mm -hmm. discovering where where the point of no return Leah, Dr. Alfred, do you have a question? I, I do. I was actually just typing it in the chat, but I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm essentially just seconding what you had said and what Professor um, Price Washington has put in the chat. Um, it's been very interesting for me to listen to um, artist talks and the web design and listen to the artists talk about the process. So yeah, what was the, for lack of a better word, assignment or prompt for any one of these works and then the process. And I appreciated you just saying that the process does include, you know, collaboration and talking and communication about the work as it's being developed. But um, I'm, I would love to hear about that processing and, and specifically um, I, biologist Jaziba, uh, if she would like to talk about one of her works, I would really appreciate that. Sounds great. Well, would one of you who has been in the experimental drawing class like to describe the process and how it's felt? Kayla, would you like to talk about it a little bit? Sure, I can do that. Um, so for most of mine, there's a few where I really just started doing things and then it kind of just came together as a whole. Um, for this one, stuff like this is like one of my favorite things to do. So I um, I took a pen and then I also took ink, which I, from this class, it was the first time I've ever used ink like that, acrylic ink. And it's really become one of my favorite mediums. Um, yeah, for this one was very kind of instinctual for me. And then, um, there was a few others where I just started doing stuff and it really came together. But I also knew, um, yeah, for this one, I took different things. Uh, it was mostly a paintbrush and pen. And then I also took this kind of metal type cylinder thing from a tool for my I use it to like scratch across with, I dip it in ink and then I like run it across the paper and it like also made the circles. And um, for parts of it, I also took white charcoal to add accent to it, but it was very um, like just automatic, I'm like just pointing it on the paper pretty much. Yeah, I, part of the process for these assignments is to start working improvisationally and then to become more intentional about the mark making while also experimenting with lots of new materials and unconventional materials and processes. And so you can see some of other Kayla's other works that are involved her photography, mm -hmm. other materials collaged onto the works. Um, Jaziba, would you like to talk about some of your works? So Jaziba has a variety of work here, including drawing as well as in the animation section. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so depending on the medium, I think my process tended to vary a lot. With this one, the this was a foreshortening assignment for Dr. Lowell's uh, figure drawing class. So um, I had a friend of mine, she had taken pictures of her sister, like doing these interesting uh, poses from different camera angles. And so this one was more like an extreme from the sole of the shoe type of perspective. And so I had used a technique that we were learning in class by like encasing the figure in like a envelope, like a linear type of, um, and pinning down like the angles of the general shape. And then just like, um, I guess carving away is like with marble, you know how like you carve in and get the figure of that in to like make it gradually more and more detailed. Um, I thought the shoes were fun to do. 
personally, just because um, there's a lot of um, texture in, in, in those shoes. And uh, throughout it, I tried to vary the lines. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> and here is some of Jazzaba's animations. So you can watch those. These animations are fairly short. Do you want to describe the process of your animations a little bit, Jazaba? Yeah. So to start off, like between these few animations and like ones I've been doing now, um, I started off by making concept sketches of what I was thinking about doing and scripting out the basic story I had. Um, I had a tendency to go overboard with my stories a lot, so I had to like dial it back a bunch. Um, and then after that, I would storyboard like the different scenes I wanted to do or like um, the points in the story that I was like, I have to include this one for it to make sense. And then after that, um, after that storyboarding process where I would draw out like these little frames of what was happening in the story, I would do the, that on paper, but then I would go into a digital program to actually start doing the animation. And I would work on different scenes at a time, first doing like the sketches of the individual scenes. And then I'd go onto the line work to make it look a bit cleaner. And then after that, I would do uh, color each and every scene and then draw the backgrounds for them. Um, so that was like, generally what I did for the animation process, uh, depending on which one I'd be doing, sometimes I'd vary, vary it a little bit, but that was uh, the overall process. And I can actually show a couple of those uh, storyboards just so you all have a sense of that process. Can you all see that? Wow. So these are Jazba's character sketches and storyboards. So this is the beginning phases of the animation. So looking at the different frames and how the animation will evolve. And then going from a more complex animation to then simplifying slightly. There's some more character sketches. So this gives you a, a sense of Jazba's inclinations. I have a question for Jazba. Are you in front of Leah? I shouldn't say this, but Dr. Alfred, are you ready to give up bio and just do animation now? You told you before, I'm trying to combine it. That was a, that was a, a trick question. You can't actually answer that. I know. <laughs> I don't actually want to encourage you to, to drop bio, but you're doing awfully well with animation. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic work. Do some of you want to describe some of your work in painting or drawing? Those of you who I maybe don't know as well. I have a question for Melissa since she's front and center on painting. Melissa, could you share your, um, I don't know that it's up, is your autobiographical piece from um, 2D Design, is it up? Um, for the one we just did? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it is under painting by accident. That's okay. Sure. Wherever it is, uh, I think it'd be fascinating. The narrative you came up with is so interesting and it's truly autobiographical. I think it'd be fun if you could tell people about it and how you used elements of design to do it. Um, Am I getting close to it? Yes, I think it's the last one on that, um, all the way down. It's gonna be- Yes, that one. There we go, it really is the last one, isn't it? Almost, oh, almost. Oh, and then I wanna see, I'm having a hard time containing myself here. Wild enthusiasm. So why don't you tell us about your autobiographical piece? That's really interesting to me. 
Okay, yeah. there we go. Um, so for this one, um, I did want an intermediate painting as well. Um, our last assignment was an autobiographical, um, but this one, um, I'm an immigrant, so I came from Uruguay and South America, um, and so I wanted to include a, a bit of my culture um, and kind of the resilience that we have as immigrants, especially coming to the United States. Um, and so most of this, I am also a DACA recipient, um, and so most of the artists or the pieces of the collage that I used to make this art um, comes from people who have a uh, DACA or are immigrants. Um, and then another part is from uh, the top part where it says Uruguay um, is from a Uruguayan artist called Torres Garcia. And so basically I kind of wanted to uh, include in the bottom where it says home is here um, and it shows the heart. And so it's kind of like, it doesn't matter what part of the country or wh wherever you're coming from, uh, you know that the family is uh, the people you have around you. So your location may change, but you know that you're in a comfortable place as long as you're with your family. Um, and so on the left side at the bottom, I have kind of this mother-child scenario, um, especially if a parent has to leave their kids behind um, or you know just the struggle of coming here with, uh, as me, for me personally, I was four years old. Uh, when I came and so in the background it's kind of like you're bringing your whole village or your whole town with you um, all of that culture is coming to wherever else you're moving um, but yeah it was mostly kind of to talk about uh, an autobiographical but also that it can apply to a lot of people at the same time thank you What if, do, uh, Aaron, do you mind if I ask, could we see the video of um, Jack's painting? Sure, that sounds great. And Jack helped me uh, design this website. So I have to give him a lot of thanks. Uh, he helped organize student work and put this website together. So he did a fantastic job helping. So thank you, Jack. Happy to do it. Jack, do you wanna talk us through this while we see it or talk to us after? Um, sure. Uh, you know, maybe I'll talk, do you, could you put it into full screen? Thank you. Okay, I'll restart it. Dr. Lowell, do you have anything specific, specifically you'd like me to touch on or just kind of an overview of well, what I'm trying to get at? Just that it's a major work and uh, I, seeing the video, which I hadn't seen before, it makes painting look so easy and fun, <laughs> which is, it may be fun, but it's not easy. Uh, but this was a major work with many layers of references that you were kind of brought together. Do you mind telling us just a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, when I when I put together the video, it frustrated me a little bit because it made it look like I uh, could have painted it in a week. Um, but it's a work that I started last October, so it's taken me seven months. Um, and this is mainly because of the conceptual boundaries of it. Um, the thesis of the painting is that I wanted to investigate the relationship between art theory and craft and the formal understanding of what art is and how to construct art and on the other end of things um, intuition stream of consciousness um, and the imagination um, and how that relates to the role of contemporary artists uh, and process and practice. Um, I took a class with Dr. Collins and I realized that this is a subject that's been addressed before in art history by Gustave Courbet. And so I was studying his work and 
um, I was really uh, taken by it. And I decided to apply it with a uh, formal language that has been implemented by both Kerry James Marshall and Romare Bearden, who are both modern contemporary artists. Um, and so that's where the kind of almost like flat graphic design-esque kind of painting style is from. But conceptually, you'll find that uh, if you look to the center, you see that my reflection is in the laptop. And if you go further away from the laptop, you'll find a um, box of paint. Further away from that is a photo pasted on the wall of me painting as a kid. And then further beyond that is just a night scene. And then as you regress closer toward where the viewer is, below the laptop is a written um, kind of uh, paint circle where you would address oils. What I'm trying to get at here is that um, the placement and arrangement of the objects is suggesting that the synthesis of both a formal understanding of the application of art theory and a personal connection and understanding of how to harness and control one's own intuition, I think, and I think Orbe thought is imperative to making good and effective art. And it takes seven months, huh? Sometimes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice. It also reminds me of a David Hockney uh, interior with flat color and mm -hmm. kind of, uh, flattened space. So generally, how does it feel for you all to see your work together? I really appreciate that um, we now have this sort of place where all of the art students can put their work so people can see them. Everything that everyone is doing is quite impressive. It's a been a long time coming and I have to say, I'm just beyond thrilled to see it y'all. I think it's also really interesting to see how different people think because it's very contrasting to like look at it all here together. Now, Anna, are you a fresh person, freshman? I am a freshman. Because you seem more mature, like maybe you're a transfer student. I couldn't tell. <laughs> no? Well, you're, um, no. you're one of many, I would say, somehow or other, we're getting an awful lot of talented people. Um, could we look at your, um, that last thing you submitted, that your uh, magnum opus to date? Sure. Um, we would scroll up to drawing, I guess it was, Aaron. Um, it was Anna's, um, Anna Pino's, somewhere coming up. Yeah, I think it's at the very top. Mm -hmm. There's so many. It's just amazing. Uh, a little up further. A little that was hers, but there's another one above it. Okay, on the right. right, yeah, that one. Now that was really just an exercise and it became a really smart work of art and it didn't have to become that complex. Uh, this Thank was an you. exercise in value pattern and yet it became something entirely more complex than it had to be. So we, I, the pattern I see, we're getting an awful lot of talented young people and um, I'm not sure where y'all are coming from, but, um, we're awfully lucky to, to see you guys at Oglethorpe, I think. Thank you. I'm very excited about this program. Well, we're excited to have y'all. Matter of fact. A few different goldfish. Another one. Now, Kristana Quinnan, she's, she's, uh, you're, you're not exactly a loud talker, Kristana. 
Can you tell us about some of the work you've got up right here? Um, is there anyone in particular you want me to talk about? Well, um, you're a bit of a, weren't you only like 16 your freshman year? I started at 15. <laughs> okay, um, overshot that by a year. Now, if you'd been 21, I would have been thrilled at what you did. So, but the fact that you were 15 uh, is just all the more, I don't know, astounding. Uh, the middle one you've got here was the one where I wanted people to play with uh, perspective and um, distort perspective for uh, some kind of emotional content. Could you tell us a little bit how you arrived at that very interesting, disturbing drawing? Um, so I said to my roommate, hey, do you want to sit in the shower so I can take some pictures for a drawing? And she was like, okay, sure. And I was like, we also might flood the bathroom. And she is completely down to do that. So we put a washcloth over the drain so that the water wouldn't go through there and took a bunch of pictures. And this is the one that I thought looked the coolest and the angle would be the most fun to draw. Yeah, it's a very smart in every way work that harnesses distortion of perspective to a sort of a, a narrative and emotional outcome. It's very sophisticated, as is all the work you have up on this site. So thank you. I think that's thank the most I've ever, I, I've ever heard you say. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Need we say more? Yeah. The origami, we're thinking about Christo who died recently. And so what you chose to do is huge origami, which is kind of a completely absurd idea in a way, isn't it? Origami by definition is always tiny. And so you did huge origami for this, uh, for this the Christo assignment. How did you come up with that idea of the big origami? Um, well, when I was looking at Christo's work, all of his stuff was very large and also pretty colorful. So I was thinking of how I could do something that I'm familiar with in that way. And the thing I came up with was origami because I really like how geometric they look and how much they contrast with nature, even though they are animals. Fantastic. Thank you. Erin, are there web designs that would require going to a separate link that are that because they're based on movement? We have, so here's animation, we have graphic design, and mm -hmm. then I have some screenshots of the web design somewhere in here. Could someone tell us a little bit about the graphic design and web design? Uh, Montserrat, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, since you've taken uh, web design as well as experimental drawing and have worked both digitally and traditionally, a bit about the difference between the two and maybe the overlap and maybe how you created some of these works? Of course, yeah. So I, um, I've taken graphic design and I'm currently taking experimental drawing. Um, and I've noticed that a lot of the designs that we did in graphic design has helped my creativity in experimental drawing as well. It is a little different because in graphic design, of course, we're on um, Illustrator and using Photoshop. And here in the experimental drawing, you can experiment basically <laughs> with everything. Um, but overall, I think it's, it's really fun. It's different, but I've loved both classes evenly. Do you want to talk a little bit about this assignment in particular, which was an alter ego logo? So students yeah. did first an alter ego and then designed a logo for that alter ego. Of course, yes. Um, so like you said, um, we had to create an alter ego. And for me, it was kind of a challenge uh, 
just because I didn't really, I had to discover my alter ego in the process. Um, so I took my zodiac sign, a Sagittarius, and I looked up um, the goddess of a Sagittarius, um, and I used that goddess to create my design. Um, so it's my face and the goddess's face mixed together into a logo. Um, and yeah, and then just my name. <laughs> Here's some other designs that Montserrat did. Wow. So these designs are mostly created through, that's Zuri Flores. But these designs are most, mostly created using, um, after a process of sketching out the designs, then using Adobe Illustrator. Do some photography folks want to talk about their work a bit? Is Julie here? She was in the uh, earlier one. I don't see her. Because uh, that's catching my eye right there. Uh, I don't see her. Well, may. So this is um, an assignment where I gave the students a list of 36 things to photograph. And, um, oh no, this is not this. This is a uh, assignment where they are given a, a, an object and they have to transform, uh, transform the object in their use or in their function or in the meaning. So, um, so those were the favorites of the students. And then, the other assignment they'll be coming up to, um, I gave the students a list of um, 36 things to photograph based on analog film photography. And so they basically had to go find and think about on hands down those images, um, whether it's a fake photograph or what is the next image, the next prompt. Um, a parking lot at night and so on. So this is the first time I'm doing it this way. Um, a couple of years ago, Alan, you might remember that we um, made an installation in the hallway at Robinson um, where all the images hung exactly precisely next to each other. Uh, so this is a, an attempt to do it digitally. We also laid them down on the on the floor at the TLCC. Right. And we would go upstairs and look over them. Right. Look so good. Make things in a pile. So, I mean, the students came up, I mean, everybody comes up with very, such different ways in which they think about or what they bring back after this, um, after the prompts. And it's always, you know, as a group assignment, um, always very exciting to see the differences, how many ways you can see things in a long line. <laughs> what becomes the thing in a long line? It becomes about searching and seeing, because when you think about, I need to think, photograph things in a long line, everything becomes things in the long line in your life. And um, so this is a bot shoplifting that was a typo, but I left it in. It was supposed to be a boy shoplifting, but now that's the new prompt for the students to figure it out. And 
And the first, the top uh, ones is from Art 109 and the second one is from Art 115. Because of being um, teaching remotely, I both teach them digital photography alike. I love Anna Pinot's the top left a plate in the air. You see um, that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. These work really well in the grid format too. Yes. Online. So then they become a. Uh, typology. Yeah, and with this photo, with this assignment, um, that was the first time the students in both classes started to work with Photoshop in particular because prior we would just work with camera and they had to find a way in which they would title the piece according what it was, whether it's an omelet and cheese omelet, uh, tomato and cheese omelet, and they had to place their name. So whatever manner and style that decided they had to be consistent through all of them. So uh, that comes back to when we had the installation in the hallway. So you can kind of, you know, see their manners, the, 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 the mannerisms in which they um, went, ahead, went about um, the, finding the work. How many categories are there? Um, 36. Uh, it's called 36 things because of 36 exposures in the film, uh, in the analog film um, uh, class when you have a, when you expose film. Um, however, I did a, have a, a, a formatting issue and it condensed it to 34, but I just still call it 36. <laughs> And then I think it's always very exciting to see when students have to figure out how to, you know, how do you photograph a smelly place? Mm -hmm. you know? How do you photograph heat? <laughs> how do you solve a problem of photographing, creating a photograph called Nigeria? So it is always this um, way in which, uh, what can you come up with that is feasible? Um, it, does anybody else have questions as we're, it's now 5.15, but I'm happy to stay on for longer if there's any friends or family here that have questions for the artists. Be happy to open it up to questions outside to anyone. Does anybody want to talk about a specific work before we wrap up? Putt or Professor Putt? Yes. Can you go into the interdisciplinary section? I think it's called expanded media. Yes. Would you like to look at, talk about your work a bit? I was going to say, ask Lauren to talk about her work. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there we go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Lauren, I go Lauren, for sorry to put you on the on the spot. <laughs> Lauren, you can do it. You've got it. Lauren here. Hope so. I don't see her. Don't know if she is anymore. No, I think she left. Oh. Well, maybe Tyler could tell us about it. Yeah, I'll I'll let you know. Um, so, and Anna, correct me if I'm if I'm uh, making any mistakes. But for the piece on the left, I think she titled it "Chewed Gum," 
and so she is in she was a mormon and growing up in class they would tell her or not her all the all the girls that um being a virgin was the most important thing and that how um virginity is basically or you as as women are pieces of gum and nobody no boy is going to want to um chew a piece of gum that's already been chewed that's so gross and um, <laughs> so that is where this work came from and um yeah so she made an entire I guess lower half of a woman who is made out of gum wrappers and obviously chewed gum but the also part of it was the fact that it's not a woman so it's and it's ooh, do I say it's a representation? A yes, yeah. It's more or less, I guess, objectification of this already objected object. I don't know if that makes sense, but that is where that came from. So really, just using the materials of that phrase to create a work. Uh, Tyler, do you mind if I add uh, a comment? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, this is such a great example of. It has such a punch when you look at it, and I get fought when I saw it just out of surprise. And it's a great example that it's fascinating by itself. And then you learn a little more about the the, the ideas behind it and the narrative. And it's it certainly expands in many ways. It becomes much more interesting and important the more, knowing that little bit extra. Anna, is there anything that you would add to the chewed gum piece that I left out? Mm. No, I think that you explained it perfectly. Okay. Are cool. these pieces related? Is the meat bag piece um, connected? Do y'all know? No, these are two separate assignments. So I wish that that we had the other two parts of this one assignment. It was called, it was something where I had the students make art for the general population and then make art for the elite sort of art worldy type of um population and this was her version of the art world art and then the one that she made for the general population was sort of this it was this the same colors but it was stamps of leaves or what do I say uh hmm. it was the imprints of leaves on canvas and they were using these colors and so it was based off of a photo that she I t I told them to bring in work that they hated and then they had to make work uh, these two versions of that piece. And I think the piece that she brought was something that she made in Lowell's class. So uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I think but, it was a painting. <laughs> so she brought in that painting and really smashed it in the sense of bringing that into this 3D sculptural installation space. And so for her, meat bag, meat bag represents the fact that artists are chewed up and spit into this machine and art world and just grinded and abused and used and then tossed away for the next greatest thing. And what's in the bag is actually meat. So it's old rotten flesh that she had in her refrigerator. And um, yeah. And then I, it's old paint too. So everything that they had to use for this assignment, they couldn't buy anything. Fantastic. Fantastic. It certainly expands the range of artwork we've seen, doesn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's one of the coolest things about having all of this work arranged together. I think it's interesting to go from web design to what we've called expanded media have this interdisciplinary focus to photography and all of the other genres represented. Uh, well, in the name of time, uh, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you to everyone who has participated. The work looks fantastic. Thank you, Jack, for all your help in organizing the work and the website. Um, this link will, will be active so you all can continue to look at the work and reach out to um, the artists whose work is presented on the website as well if you have questions outside of uh, this presentation, this panel. Uh, so thank you again. Fantastic job to you all. Um, your work looks wonderful. Thank you again for being here.
make sure you look at all of the wonderful comments in the chat. Thank you. Thank all of you. What a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful day.